a Michael Killen, the world recently lost a fine human being and an outstanding artist loved by untold number of people, including myself. And he was Harry Cohen. On this show, I have invited Professor Frederick Holly, who was also a dear friend of Harry Cohen, to come on this show. And we're going to help remembering that fine artist who was full of life all the way up to the end. Professor Holly, how are you today? Very good. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for coming on the show. And can I just ask, when did you meet Harry? I met Harry many years ago, probably uh, uh, 1956, 7, in uh, San Diego, at La Jolla, actually. He was having a, a one-man show at where I was teaching, at the La Jolla M Museum of Art School. And uh, my first impact was seeing his work in a gallery on the floors yet, because it hadn't been on, but it was a one-man show he was having. And it knocked me out. I, they, were on, they weren't even hanging. They were on the floor. And I was going to my class, but I got so caught up in the looking at these paintings that I was late for about 20 minutes, and I immediately dragged my class into that gallery because I wanted them to see him. Remarkable artist. When you dragged your class down there, what did you expect them to see? I know paintings, but yeah. more than paintings. Well, I expected them to, to be a little uh, unsettled because these were abstract expressionist paintings, and it was a newish form for them to see. It was not like the uh, American regionalist artists where everything is sort of storytelling. It was, it had subject, but it was also non-objective, gave you the room to move around and interpret yourself your, your about what you're looking yeah. at. Move around in your head and in yes. your feelings. That's what I meant, yeah. But before we go further, let's bring up a photo of Harry Cohen. Yes. And there he is, and Fred, and I think you know where that photo was taken. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I believe it was taken in his house in Marin County, and as you know, he lived on the side of a hill, and you had to take this one-lane dirt road to get to his place, and then you had to find a place to park on this one-lane dirt road, and then he had an elevator right. from the street, from this dirt street. The elevator took you up to his second floor. Maybe it was his first floor. And that's where Harry Cohen lived. And, and then if you, his studio was further up the mountain. <laughs> yes. And he had a little railroad <laughs> track that, that got, him exactly up there. got him up there. So you first met him in La Jolla when both of you men were very young. Yeah. And the first time you saw his art, it was laying down, I guess, was getting ready to be Being prepared to be hung in the gallery. Yeah. And you immediately saw something. I was taken. <laughs> I was going to teach a class, and I thought, here's, here's the lesson for the day. I'm bringing him down here. <laughs> okay. Harry, Harry did all the talking that day, <laughs> in a way. His work did. Yeah. yeah. Before we get to his work, behind you is a painting that, if I understand this correctly, you made, and it was inspired. No? Uh, not behind me. Mine is behind you. Oh, that's behind you. The one behind you is by Harry? No, that is by Harry, yes. This is a, a, a print I made of a, of a painting probably from about 1967 or so. Uh, Harry was an abs, abs, what we called at the time an abstract expressionist artist. Uh, that art form was based on intuition, passion, and uh, action brush strokes. It's the time when people, in order to, because they didn't understand the paintings, to make fun of them, they said monkeys did them and all that sort of thing. Okay. But your 
description of abstract expression is. It, you included the word action. Uh, you left out the word figurative. It's not. It's weak no, on figure. No, no, not. no. Well, it, the subject was both the composition itself, but also, if you could see closely on this one, Harry was a classical draftsman. He had all the drawing training of traditional art students. So he, at this time, he would enter that into the painting periodically. If you look at that, you'll see a, a, a nude lady uh, in a divan. And uh, uh, so in a very beautiful contour drawing, contours where you draw the edge of the figure in beautiful lines. And Harry included that in that piece. But that's when, in his beginning, by the way, briefly, the abstract expressionists were basically from Europe mostly, especially uh, Willem de Kooning, who was a wonderful, wonderful artist. And they started the movement in about 1947. So this might have been around 1948 or 49. Harry was taken with them because it was a natural thing for him. He is an, an expressionist artist, or was. And uh, as you'll see, he progressed through life into something very unique and something very personal and uh, as an individual artist of a kind. Two points. Mm -hmm. I once asked Harry, maybe 10 years ago, where does he fit in the various themes of art, like abstract expressionists? And you know what he said to me? Go ask Professor Holly. <laughs> and he says to me, Michael, I don't understand where I'm at. You know, I'm just making beauty. I'm, I'm helping to organize the world, or at least my little world, what I'm painting. So that's one thing he said to me. Go ask Professor Holly, what kind of artist am I? And the other thing he said to me, I wouldn't call me an abstract painter or expressionist. He, he stayed away from that. But can you elaborate on? I think he did it later in his life. He rejected the identity of that. Number one, because he had gone beyond it. But number two, because what happens in the art scene, you get a movement going abstract expressionism. Uh, it goes for a while, and the, and the market in the art world makes a lot of money with them. But then it's time, like the fashion industry, there's a new one coming up, pop art, or something like that, or op art, uh, or recently conceptual art. And that's coming up mostly to offer new products that they can get the collectors interested in so they spend money. But Harry knew that. And he didn't want to be titled with the name of a, what fundamentally is a defunct uh, art form. Okay. Abstract expression, okay. expressionism no longer existed as such. Okay. Harry also said to me, Michael, if you want a portrait of anybody to help you, Michael, in making your work, maybe I'll make it for you. But I have a rule, Michael. I will only make a portrait of somebody who is good, doing good for this world. He made a portrait uh, for me on uh, the governor of California, Jerry Brown. He thought he was doing a good job for the people, especially trying to get the state moving to be a leader in reducing greenhouse gases mm -hmm. to reduce the threat of climate change. But he also made a painting of Stanford's, at the time, greatest climatologist. And maybe the crew would be kind to bring up the portrait he made of uh, Stephen Schneider. And as they come up and bring up Stephen Schneider's photo, his wife sent me a note. And, and I'm going to read it just so the audience can get a feel for how Harry was valued. There's uh, 
Steve oh, Schneider. Yeah. I never this saw is that. what Terry Root, and she is a senior fellow, university faculty of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment and at Stanford University. I never saw that. I really, Terry I, really, I love Root it. Fisk, <laughs> when my late husband, Stephen Schneider, died unexpectedly, I was left with memories and photographs to remind me of events in our lives. But thankful, Harry did several paintings of Steve. Harry was a brilliant painter because not only did he capture the likeness of Steve, but he also captured the quirks of his personality. These paintings I treasure because they are vivid reminders to me of Steve's wonderful personality. Every day, I thank Harry for his paintings, while at the same time embracing wonderful memories of Steve. The world, I hate to read this now because it affects me, the world has lost a very talented painter with the past passing of Harry. Of Harry. That's a very beautiful letter, and that's a very beautiful Maybe we could see the other. Uh, we could see the other one he made of Steve Schneider, I and would. I'm happy to say that that's the other Steve Schneider. When Stanford University hosted the the service for Steve Schneider and then senators and lots of VIPs and and his his friends and colleagues came. Well, I'm very glad to see, see these because I've never seen this deep a portrait by Harry because he went mostly non-objective, that is, abstract. Yeah. And uh, I knew he was a good draftsman, that he drew beautifully, but I never saw one, saw one of these. And uh, it, it gets to what I was talking about a little earlier with you in the car about about the... the, um, the uh, um, the issues regarding emotions in abstract expressionism. It's an emotional form. It's based on intuition. So when Harry draws, he not only draws from uh, the subject itself, but he goes into an emotional interpretation. It's just natural for that kind of a, yeah. a temperament, that kind of a personality. Yeah. And before, well, let me just finish this yeah. other oh, thing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, um, Stanford displayed those two paintings mm. at Steve Schneider's service. And, and then NASA put on an event. Those two, I'm not sure if it were those two exact portraits. Harry did five or six for, to honor Steve Schneider. They were also displayed at NASA University. So Harry's art got around to some very interesting uh, places. Before we go any further, I was wondering if the crew would now start showing some of Harry's larger paintings, and these are more recent paintings, and maybe as each one comes up, I could ask you, what do we see here? Could I uh, ask you if, 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 if we could feature on this one for the moment so I can point out the drawing in it that... Uh, We'll get, we'll, oh, okay, whatever this is the is. first one up here. We'll come back to that. All right. This is a large painting. I, I would say it's about three feet by, by five feet high. We're not going to stay long on it, but what do you see that's interesting there? Well, there's always the passion with Harry, and there's always, um, I don't know, it's, there's always a joy, even, even in the uh, ones that... Uh, have attention to them, uh, okay. attention. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Sure. Can we see another one, please? Yeah, look at that. Another thing, the compositional versatility he has. When people do portraits or anything of that nature, it's usually the traditional way or frontal, that sort of thing. Harry, makes it move across the page.
picture yeah. plane in quite a different way. Oh yeah, he likes to move the eye around. Could we right. go to the next one, please? Oh, he in his later years he got very much interested in black and whites and drips. He loved to hang uh, liquid above his paintings and let it and drip run down. down. What do you see there? Well, I see, for one thing, as always, the drawing is beautiful, but the love of the material. Yeah. I mean, it's, there are more than drips when Harry does it. Uh, he loved paint. It was like blood to him. I mean, he understood paint. Yeah. Most of us, uh, as we're learning to be artists, uh, uh, have a tough time with paint. It's a separate substance. With Harry, it's part of his body. I mean, he... Yes. <laughs> He just was incredible with the medium. Can we go to the next painting? And I, I want to share one thing Harry said to me a few times when he's been painting. Michael, I love to take red and just jam it into wet black and to create interesting imagery. We'll, we'll skip your comment here. Can we go to the next one because we... We have time. Just a... Okay, you want to make a comment about that, Fred? Uh, that that's a pretty deep one. I mean, he's got several layers there. Uh, uh, sometimes Harry will do it very briefly. You see, there's the issue. I, I brought it up earlier in our conversation. Uh, a phrase that I love is the agony and the ecstasy. Uh, it's a title I I remember from an old movie uh, about Mich Michelangelo's life. The agony and the ecstasy. And all artists, especially younger ones, know what the agony is because you're learning how to use material. Yeah. But with Harry, there never was any agony in, my, in her, his pictures. No, I never saw pain. Yeah. We have another one. I never saw him in pain. He, he could just walk right up and attack the canvas. They were always ecstasy. Yeah. He was ecstatic when he was got a brush in his hand. Okay, before, I forget if we have more photos up there, but what about that one? That's, that one... Uh, did, did you want to comment? Yes, you I... had a comment back on the one behind you? Yes, I, I wonder if they could get a little closer to it, can you? Uh, well, some way. I, or I, I guess not. It might not. be a problem. Oh, well, then maybe we should not, uh, because the parts I wanted to emphasize are very detailed. So okay. Let's forget that one. I would like to share something about my relationship with Harry, okay? Whenever I said to him, I'm taking on a big project, like make a painting for NASA called Sustainability, 24 feet. Mm. The first thing I always did was to call Harry and I would tell him about the project. The next thing out of his mouth, Michael, come pick me up. Take me to your house. I'm going to stay at your house for two days. Well, come up here. And what we would do is I would share what I was thinking about, how I'm going to approach the painting. And he would say to me, Michael, let's make as many mistakes on this project as fast as possible. Let's eliminate all the false starts. And what I mean by that is even in business, when businesses create strategies and plans to sell stock, raise money, or get sales. They put a plan together, but as soon as you announce the plan and start executing it, that's when you get feedback. Mm -hmm. And that's when you re realize, well, maybe you shouldn't have done it this way or that way. Harry used to sit with me for a weekend to try to get rid of all the false, bad starts so that when I took him home, I at least could now go to work on the painting and maybe there's two, three false starts that I will not experience. And it was just a truly wonderful relationship. I'm gonna let you speak in a little while, sure. just forgive me. But the last project Harry and I were working on was a project of love for both of us. He fell in love with the music of Ennio Morricone. 
<clears throat> you know, his hearing wasn't too good. And if he was in a car and we were driving and we had the music on, he wanted it as loud as it could be. And so Ennio Morricone's 91st birthday is coming up in the first week of November. Harry and I were making paintings to celebrate Ennio's uh, birthday. And, but what Harry was doing, for the most part, since he was this great draftsman, this great skillful, he, maybe we can't see it well, he would make sketches of, in this case, Ennio. Here's another one over there. Oh, yeah. For the Ennio project, he made five sketches for me and it was first to help me get ideas on how I was going to paint Ennio. And then he made some Ennio paintings for himself. Mm. And we planned a couple of weeks before Ennio's birthday in November to release these paintings. You know, Harry Cohen and Michael Killen paintings celebrating Ennio Morricone's birthday. But that's how we worked for, I don't know, 10, 15 years. That's fantastic. And it became a partnership and I tapped into his, his great historic knowledge. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not an Ennio painting. This is just one he's, he did recently. I like that one a lot. Yeah. Well, I like your old one, but that one especially nails me. You know, his drawing ability uh, was, I was always hoping to see some things that he had done when he was learning to draw because you can see what he came from there and so forth. But uh, he used to kid me because I'm a classical draftsman by the, in most cases. And uh, he used to kid me about how much he loved the ears in my painting. Ears. Your ears are a particular challenge. If you ever look at one, you'll see it. <laughs> it's tough. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and he, he would compliment me on my ears, which I always appreciated. <laughs> okay. Now, you started to say uh, something about how, or maybe I wanted you to say it, on how Harry thinks when he makes a painting. Well, Before you answer, I asked him, how, how do you think before you put anything up? And he said to me, Michael, I don't know. And then when I pushed him and pushed him, he says, I remember the last painting I made and I was trying to do something. What it was, I don't know. I don't know about the past. So, what was he trying to paint? What was in his head when he walked up to the canvas? You're talking about the, the recent painting, the pops, the ones you've called? Not just the paintings on paper, but the, some of the paintings we just showed here. Uh -huh. He, like when I paint, I'm painting a message. I know the message and I'm going to paint it. I'm going to put it in context. He didn't have messages. What did he have? Uh, he, he did have messages, but they were short, succinct statements. For example, when he did those paintings on paper, he literally, uh, he, he became what I call an action painter because he moved fast and he, the statement that would appear was in effect a, 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 a um, portrait of his feeling, an actual image that looked to him like how he felt, uh, which is quite remarkable. Now, the thing about it, briefly, just to, an expressionist artist usually deals with human, the human condition. Uh, I'm one too. I'm an expression artist. And the only reason I bring this up is my painting is over there behind you, one of mine. And the way I express my feeling or make a portrait of it is I, I stay with a more representational look. I personify an emotion and that's what that's supposed to represent. Harry 
personifies, he doesn't personify, he, he materializes in an image his feelings, like magic. You know, I, yeah, I stay with the traditional. He was the innovator. He was the guy that got out there and took chances, a lot of chances. And Harry loved chances. Yes. He loved to take chances because there would always be that surprise at the bottom of the barrel, you know. Yes, he took risks. But I think that's you're right. saying something that's really important. Most artists are going to paint a landscape, a seascape, or an object, or like me, a message. But Harry walked up to a canvas, and it, it was how he felt. And if he felt like trying, if he was sad, maybe he tried to capture that. And he that, would. That's yeah. exactly what he did. He 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 he, he didn't. He did, rarely failed. Yeah. That's the that's the miracle. Yeah. Uh, when I talk about the agony and the ecstasy, I'm talking about there's a lot of agony sometimes. And, uh, but Harry always triumphed with the ecstasy, always. And he wanted people to love. Yes. Really, really love his work. Now, I do want to make an announcement. Uh, in uh, Silicon Valley, one of the most important art galleries is Art Venture Gallery, and that's in Menlo Park, and it is going to present Harry Cohen, a retrospective, December the 13th to February the 2nd. That'll be at Art, Art Ventures Gallery in Silicon Valley, specifically Menlo Park. And again, it's a uh, December the 13th, a Friday, and it ends February the 2nd. We will be there, won't we, Fred? Yes. And so will a lot of people. And I am aware that a television station up in uh, San Rafael is also going to produce a show somewhat like we did right here to help commemorate, honor, lovable Harry Cohen. And uh, would you like to say something else before we end this show? Well, all I can say is I'll miss him. I, uh, in a world uh, such as in which we live, it's hard to get along without a Harry. I'll tell yes. you that. Yes. I want to thank you. My guest was Professor Frederick Holly. I'm Michael Killen. Harry, we miss you. Rest in peace.